several times, um, uh, be coming up here on March 8th and March 22nd. So um, once again, I am, I am humbled by the community's in engagement in, in this process. And uh, really, while well, we've got like, you know, uh, 40 participants here and uh, Jenny will be sharing some of the, the numbers that we've uh, been able to interact with people over social media and emails, et cetera. And I am always just very, very grateful for people who take time out of their busy lives to, to engage with us or in really, you know, any um, uh, local government to have, you know, give us your input and help us shape, shape the future. Um, I'd like to start this meeting reminding folks that the Port of Olympia is a special purpose local um, district of local government and that we really live with a foot in both worlds. So we are a mission driven organization and we have all the duties that go along with being, being a public agency. But we're all, um, that mission, um, mission has us focus on three core areas, ec creating economic opportunities, stewarding the natural environment and uh, creating and caring for community assets. But we also live with it, you know, the, the foot in, in both worlds. So we have to operate in the marketplace as, as well. And that makes us really different as a, a local government. So we uh, operate our, our businesses in a very competitive marketplace and um, create those economic opportunities and also use our proceeds to then be able to support all the um, other community amenities and, and access to the water, et cetera, that the community uh, wants. So we're mission driven, we're, um, we are a public agency, but we also operate in the marketplace. And take it, Amos. Okay, uh, I have stepped in. I'm Ron Thomas, okay. president of Thomas Architecture Studios, and we're playing a little chair shuffling here. And again, I wanted to thank everyone uh, for participating and uh, a good word of thanks to those who have participated in previous public outreach sessions with us. Uh, our whole effort of our waterfront destination plan is an outgrowth of the study done in 2018. Um, and one of those areas of focus was the waterfront. And so this series of meetings, public outreach that we've done is an opportunity to focus on this waterfront area. And we've been reaching out for your ideas on alternative uh, development opportunities, uh, uses that are possibilities for various sites up and down this waterfront. Also connections. Connections have been very important. Uh, I look at them as view corridors and access corridors from the public realm to the edge of the water, uh, connections along the edge of the water, connections back to the city, connections clear back to the west part of the peninsula and the, uh, uh, the wonderful boardwalk that we have there. Uh, and then we have um, enhanced opportunities for environmental improvements as well along our shoreline, many different options that Amos is gonna show you and some of you have seen in previous presentations but uh, from soft armoring to uh, just uh, uh, green opportunities to overwater uh, opportunities. And so we've been seeking your input. Amos is gonna share with you some of the feedback uh, from the two um, surveys that we've taken. And all of this input that we're receiving is gonna go forward to influence future planning on specific parcels. And Sam alluded to this um, they have a charge to uh, put their properties into good use. Uh, sometimes that means uh, use in the marketplace. There might be income generating uses, but also that doesn't mean it excludes other nonprofits, uh, uses that are good for the public, both our city of Olympia residents and visitors uh, to our community. And so we have uh, gone through, gosh, a long process, many months with the uh, ears wide open, listening to your input. And we hope this evening it's a continuation of that. And then that is gonna be brought forward to uh, the port commissioners here in the coming weeks. And Sam's gonna give a little bit of an overview at the end of this evening to what the next steps are. Uh, so, and we are gonna have a nice uh, time for you to share 
uh, questions here towards the end of Amos's uh, presentation. So with that, thank you again for your input and we look forward to spending time with you this evening. So, excuse me, I'm gonna let Amos sit back in my chair here. <laughs> All right, go ahead. All right, thanks for that. Um, quite a bit to cover, and we do want to have some time at the end for some uh, questions and feedback. So I'm going to go through some of the stuff pretty quick. This will be posted up on the ports uh, webpage as well for you to uh, review on your leisure. So this slide here is the Curb Grant uh, Community Economic Revitalization Board, and something that the port went through back in May uh, received fifty thousand. So Basically for the, this destination waterfront development vision and serves as a marketing tool for investors. It was a follow-up of the 2050 vision plan, 18 month study back in 2018, working on community awareness, uh, alignment with investment community priorities, strength and partnerships, and uh, establish a shared vision uh, for the port and their focus and impact. One other thing we wanted to share, this might be new to some of you, is some guiding principles to this project. Um, there's a lot of words here, and um, I think it's important we should kind of go through them briefly. So uh, I'll start. Balance and honor. The destination waterfront will balance commercial development with a mix of mission-driven enterprises that incorporate our maritime heritage, beauty, and natural environment, and rich artistic community. The Port of Olympia supports the implementation of the City of Olympia's downtown strategy and honors the Squaxin Island tribe who have stewarded these lands and waters since time immemorial. This is for you. Sustainability, development on the Port Peninsula will address the reality of sea level rise and environmental legacies by incorporating principles of sustainable design and striving in a net positive environmental impact. The uh, destination waterfront will create a balanced portfolio, of businesses and endeavors that are financially sustainable. And then community. Throughout community and neighborhood coordination, the destination waterfront will welcome visitors and locals alike, amplify the effects to attract kids and lifelong learners and provide opportunities to learn, work and play. Development on the Port Peninsula adds to the resiliency of the community by creating economic opportunities, stewarding the natural environment and caring for community assets. And then also a um, generate an outcome statement. So kind of the goal of what we wanna see this um, study Kind of the fruits of the study, if you will. Port Peninsula develops as a destination waterfront that offers first-rate restaurants, recreation, public art, visitor accommodations, and gathering places while ensuring connectivity with the water near shore and the existing downtown core. Within 10 years, the destination waterfront features an inviting and walkable environment that home to at least an anchor hospitality tenant, port business, and administrative offices, and a mix of mission-driven and small business enterprises. Uh, there are public amenities, interpretive and educational displays, and opportunities for both active and passive recreation with an emphasis on view preservation. Standards for adaptation to sea level rise have been developed and implemented, and environmental cleanup and restoration efforts are well underway. Uh, a lot there, a lot to take in. Feel free to go back and review that. Uh, so quickly, just a summary of who we are, um, where, this, um, where we're headed, um, the group that had put this, this plan together. There we are, Thomas Architecture Studios. You met Ron, I'm Amos Calendar. Um, we have um, responsibility to the port. We've been working with Rachel Jameson and Sam Giveney, the executive director, who then ultimately um, go back to the commissioners. Uh, and then we also had a few consultants on our team, makers, John Owen, SiteWorks, John Payne, SCJ Alliance with Bob Connolly and Abigail Mitchell from Mount McDonald. And you also see right below that the general public advisory group and select stakeholders. So other people that have responded to uh, kind of answered us, we reached out to and we've filtered that information back to the port in this final presentation. Here's a slide of the advisory group members that we had. We initially started out with this list here and then through um, some recommendations by the commission, we added the following uh, nine members as well to receive some of their impact. Just felt it was important for them to, to provide some feedback on, on this. They had some, some key um, stake in the, in the plan here. We also had some select stakeholder interviews listed here. Those was a list of several questions. We, again, the port just thought some of these 
organizations were very vital and important to the neighborhood and area. We wanted to get some of their feedback on this plan. Here is our project schedule. You can see in the yellow arrow there, um, there we are in March and uh, basically just wrapping up this final presentation before it goes out to the commission. One key aspect that's always been uh, important for the port is this Inter International Association for Public Participation, IA2P2. And in that we have this kind of involved and collaborative stage and that's where we're working right now. So you can see kind of aspects, but really trying to get the public feedback, um, be part of that process, working together with the community to make sure we're, we're hearing what they're having to say and, and collaborating with them. Here's a brief summary of our public outreach. So you can see here, we've actually uh, had 11,000, over 11,000 social media outreaches. Excuse me for a second. Uh, we had almost 400 public meeting participants and well over 3,000 uh, email contacts. So we've definitely um, done all we could for the most part to get the word out and get some public feedback. Here you can see some of the schedules that we put together for those, the red public outreach meetings, the blue advisory board meetings, and then select stakeholders and commission meetings. So started back in October and wrapping up here in, in March. We also uh, sent out two different public surveys. Uh, you can see the results there, the number of participants, 440 survey one, 385 and survey two. And then uh, now I just want to go over basically the uh, public input summary. So this is survey number one. All this is on the porch website, so you can go through this in more detail at your leisure. So I just want to click through these pretty quick. Uh, a lot of people were familiar with the 2050 vision plan from survey one. Some of the big takeaways here being the waterfront decision development plan would achieve. They wanted it to be a community hub, a tourist destination, incorporate a museum or uh, provide open space, also consider a business center or maybe um, focus on some environmental sustainability aspects. This one is regarding to uh, opportunities for development they should consider. Art and entertainment was high on the list, business center, mixed use, public access, recreation, um, kind of tapers down into considering housing, lodging, RV, just other things that needed to be looked at. Question five, uh, public access to water. Uh, a lot of the public wanted to see a small boat resource, extend a walking trail, incorporate public parks, community space. And again, you see this kind of recurring theme of consider environmental stewardship and remediation. Question number six, how should the area look in 60 years? Uh, they wanted to see great public access, uh, public spaces, parks, increased small business opportunities, uh, connection to downtown, environmental remediation, provide opportunities for mixed use, and also increase uh, recreation and tourism in this area. Question seven, what opportunities would benefit the community? Here you can see things like public access amenities, education museum, small boat, or small business, uh, more arts and entertainment, and then a sailing boning center was also on the list. And a few other takeaways from the survey. Uh, they want to be collaborative with neighbors community, maintain awareness, provide uh, community multi-use space, maritime environmental cultural space, ensure environmental and financial sustainability, provide outdoor public spaces, concerns about tourist accommodations, and concerns about proposed uses within the context of each site. Survey number one was very um, kind of open-ended, a lot of opportunity for just typed in comments. So we took all this information, boiled it down. That's what you saw was kind of the, the key phrase summary of, of that um, feedback that we, re we received. Survey number two was a little more um, graphic oriented, a lot of click type questions to be answered. Um, so here you can see just asking how familiar were they with the uh, waterfront destination development plan? And about 44% were somewhat familiar. And then a little over half did not participate um, in survey number one, 41% did. And then this question was about access to water. You could see we had some graphic images and the response was um, pretty consistent among the three of a small watercraft launch, bench wall, or a promenade boardwalk is the kind of the top three 
ways to access water that the public mm -hmm. wanted to see. Number four questions regarding the uh, children's play structure within these sites. How important was that? And you can see three and a half out of five stars. So it's somewhat important to the public to see some sort of play structure on these sites. Question five was about potential shoreline improvements, which options they prefer the most. You can see on the left there that 48% wanted to see some sort of living shoreline. And we'll get into what some of the other shoreline improvements might be uh, a little bit later in this presentation. Of rock, uh, reinforced earth, bulkhead seawall is also lower on the list. Question six was a rank and order of preference, a style of architecture that could be best suited for this area. And pick your top three favorite styles. You can see by far Pacific Northwest was the favorite style. Uh, Longhouse was also higher on the list. Craftsman Industrial started to kind of taper in there. There was also traditional, neo traditional, and contemporary were some other options that didn't receive as, as many points. And then this one is about uh, relating paths and connectors in development areas. So how does people get from the path, the Billy Frank Jr. Trail from this destination, um, all these little individual sites, how do they get from that back to the public, down to, to downtown, what are those connectors? And so the boardwalk was one of those um, paths and connectors that was highly graded and tree-lined as well as a combined bike pedestrian path. Other options like paved open, separated, or crushed stone were, were on the list. Concrete open area, uh, pavers, so some sort of paver system, or uh, landscaped and paved infill. Paved infill was pretty low. That's a very densely populated. We kind of got the sense from the, the public that they didn't want to see a lot of, of dense infill on these sites. This question was in regards to options for an event gathering space. And of the five there, covered wood was by far the number one choice. Uh, covered steel was also uh, an option, but uh, public sent a, a very clear message what they'd like to see for some sort of event gathering space that could host um, weddings or other kind of public rental type events where they can get together and have meetings. Question nine was about gateways and connectors. And I have a slide a little bit later that will show some uh, graphics and images of this. Um, but Barber Archway was the preferred choice. Plaza, open area was pretty close next to that. You know, there was informational signage, sculptural signs, artistic markings in the sidewalks or um, walkways it was also an option. You can see they went down into the negative and this was kind of a, a graded scale of Things I like most, things I like least. So if it liked least, it got some negative points. So you can see Beacon actually get pretty low in, in scoring there. This slide basically sharing how we are incorporating some of the feedback we received into this presentation. So through the process, we were asked to provide additional meetings added to the project schedule. We just, uh, the commission saw the value in that and we extended our meetings and added um, they felt another month to the schedule and and a few more meetings as well to reach out and get the feedback. Uh, longer outreach process. So uh, we talked about schedule then, but also in the surveys, we extended those surveys out as well. They had a certain set uh, end time, but we extended that to get uh, a cast a broader net of feedback. Ensure, ensure environmental and financial sustainability. So we talked about this, I think it was back in public outreach number two about environmental and financial um, requirements and, and abilities of the port. And we can get into some of that a little bit further. Uh, transparency, just wanted to be very open and transparent about um, of the process, how it's um, happening. So we created a project web page, which establishes all the meetings, presentations, all the data that's been gathered. It's posted on that web page for the public to access and see. Um, document community, community uh, comments incorporated attachments. So all the comments that we're receiving, emails, things like that are getting documented in an electronic file that is attached to this final presentation that we'll be sharing with the commission. So they'll have access to that at, if they like. Documented summary of survey results, which again, you'll see up on the um, website, but that's also gonna be a reference tool moving forward uh, for future development as Ron mentioned, that we're gonna loop back to that and start to pull from that. What is this, the public wanted and how can we apply that to, to future development? Top features suggested was the boating center. That was not something that was originally um, suggested, but we incorporated that in the 
development plan. You'll see that a little bit further on. Light industrial was also mentioned. I think our first public outreach that was brought up many times, addressing sea level rise. Um, it's always something we've been considering, but we're ex we've expanded a little bit more to help the public understand how we're actually addressing that on the sites a little bit better. Retain some existing public amenities. Um, some of the features there on the site um, out on the peninsula, the public really like and want to maintain like the parking lot area where it's a great access for someone to go and park and have a, eat their lunch and go uh, be able to see the water. There's a really fine junior trail that's along the water edge there that's gonna retain, be retained and uh, people can access and walk along that as well. Mixed use housing, so maybe consider some of that as a potential use. And then view preser preservation, that's also something that's very important to the public that we've inc incorporated here. And you'll see that in another slide to come. So now take a minute, we'll talk about zoning and sea level rise. There's a lot of text here. We don't need to go through it all, but these are the RCWs established by the state of basically kind of governing what the port can and can't do with their property, with their assets. Um, things like they can't be gifted, um, need to construct, condemn, purchase, acquire, maintain within the district. So all the rules and regulations. So of this development plan, the port has certain things that kind of tie their hand, if you will, um, moving forward. So they just have to make sure and follow all, all these RCWs that have been established. And then we also have some zoning regulations. So this is the urban waterfront zone. And you can see here on the left, uh, a lot of text, all these are um, permitted uses. I've added in color some of the things that seem to line up with um, the development plan, things like an office, a boat, a boat storage, commercial recreation, museums, apartments, retail. So there's plenty of opportunity for different types of uses in here. Um, just one thing to note, you'll see at the bottom, RV parks currently allowed in the urban waterfront zone, and we're going through a code text amendment. Um, it's a process right now just to further define that use. And then there's also some limitations by the United States Army Corps that we just need to also meet as well in this development. Uh, so besides zoning, the city also has some regulations regarding height, um, coverage, things like that. So within the urban waterfront zone, there's, you have a few different areas, but basically have a 40 foot uh, allowable height limitation that we're dealing with. There's some that's 45 and 65 as well, but for the most part, it's 40 feet. Uh, there are no setbacks required, but there are some um, shoreline setback requirements that we'll get into. And then coverage, we could actually cover up to 60 to 100% um, of the sites, just depending on where it's located. Parking requirements, there's some others. Oh, sorry, one more thing, the shoreline. So shoreline also has a max height of 40 feet, but they're setbacks. They have the 100 foot shoreline setback that we have to meet. So multiple kind of code sections that we need to follow. So moving forward, development plans should look at and accommodate for all of these code requirements. Parking is another issue that uh, needs to be resolved. Lots of uh, parking requirements and opportunities. You can see on the map on the right, some hatched area that is actually uh, exempt parking area for uh, city municipal code. So there's some uh, potential to take advantage of that, but also you can see some of the parking requirements listed below, depending on the type of use that might go in, into that space. Here's a slide about the view preservation that I talked about earlier. You can see on the right, all those little red arrows pointing at different key sites or features that the city has established as important. For example, Mount Rainier, the Olympic Mountains, uh, Bud Inlet, or the Black Hills, the Capitol Building, and Capitol Lake. So you can see the two arrows pointing north, kind of there in the center, pointing out toward the Olympics is the primary kind of view preservation that needs to be maintained. So uh, in those codes, we need to reserve a reasonable portion uh, for some territorial or immediate views of those features. Um, and that can be accomplished by providing lookouts, viewpoints, um, view corridors, and basically providing access to those already established scenic vistas. And then looking at sea level rise, here's a slide of an example. This was actually taken from a report uh, put together by the city in conjunction with the port and with lot. And basically how to address sea level rise. There's some, some key features like a raised street, 
raised landscaping on the top right of the flood wall. You can see another option like uh, bottom left raised buildings, living shoreline, and even temporary. Uh, temporary, it's kind of a, it's a odd name, but basically temporary could be a, a permanent system that is, is deployed temporarily when sea level rise. When water comes up, deploy the barrier, and water goes down, that's, that little gray barrier can be removed and um, returned to operation. You can see on the right an example of how to address some of that, maybe with a boardwalk or a proposed wall that might cover some of that at, um, sea level rise. And then here's another slide with another example up on the top left. Um, you can imagine that might be like the Billy Frank Jr. Trail that during kind of normal conditions, that's a walkable path, but in the event of sea level rise, the raised landscape would protect the rest of the peninsula from when the water is coming in. Bottom left be another example of some living shoreline or on the bottom right, a more hardened type approach. So I think looking at this needs to be addressed um, on a site specific level that I don't think there's one solution that's gonna answer or solve sea level rise for, for the whole peninsula. So you can see here uh, various examples like uh, up on the top right, that long green bar uh, currently over site H, uh, a living shoreline that we're proposing might be a great spot for that, that particular site, uh, very limited in development area. It's long and skinny, not a lot of building can go there. So there's a potential that a living shoreline would be a good use for that, a good um, measure to deploy on that site. They're kind of on the edge of site E, F and G, Maybe that's a combination of living shoreline and or a raised landscape area. As you march for, further to the north along site C and site D, uh, I see some potential for some flood walls. There might be a more need to provide a harder edge along the marina there so people can access um, onto those slips, uh, gain access to boats and the boat launch there. You can see um, there at the boat launch on the kind of top left of the, the image uh, with that red bar, pink bar. So maybe there's some sort of temporary rapid deployment system um, at that boat launch that could protect the inland um, from water coming in. There's other features like raised streets. There's not a lot of opportunity here that streets already established, but it's not out of the picture. So maybe they're along site B, which has already been elevated. There's a potential that a raised street could, could be addressed there. Um, you also can see out at the point um, site OW-1 over water one, and down at the bottom of that over water two in blue, uh, raised buildings. So getting the buildings up off the water, you can already see that's actually a photo of the KG Wife radio station, which is already on over water site one. Um, there's that bottom portion, which is the terminal, that's not in our scope of study, but just looking at some potential um, sea level rise issues, because it does have to be protected from all sides from water coming in. So maybe that, again, some sort of flood wall system that is deployed, uh, set into play at some point. So now I'd like to jump into the development site plans. These are the individual sites that we've established. So looking at the area in pink, you can see um, bottom left, over water site one and two, we got site A and then marching around to the top right all the way up to site I, and then inland we have site um, J and I, J and K. And I'll get through some of those and explain each of those sites a little bit further, what some proposed uses might be for those particular sites. This slide is explaining some of the linkages and the plans, um, how we're gonna connect people uh, as they either are on these sites, there's some development happening, they're, they're visiting, they're, they're there, on those individual sites, how do they get back to and connect with the rest of downtown? So you can see just marching along the shoreline there, that's the Billy Frank Jr. Trail. So that's one connector that basically goes from the point all the way back to the uh, south um, of the inlet there. And then connecting to those at um, key points in between each of those sites, we're looking at some sort of connector or linkage that you saw earlier as part of one of the survey questions, but what does that linkage look like? So we strategically try to place those 
in between those sites to provide ample opportunity for public to access from the water back to inland to get to downtown. You can see also in the blue dotted line there that is the proposed um, protected bike lane the city of Olympia is moving forward with. So that's a key north-south connector for bikes and pedestrians. And then in purple might be more of a say, vehicular traffic type connector. But we do see a lot of that connection coming from the south down on kind of the main state and, and um, capital built streets connecting along Capitol Way back to the farmer's market and then out to the east towards the, the rest of the peninsula and to where this destination development plan is kind of set up. So that's the, the main flow of traffic and looking at how we can uh, establish those linkages and gateways to, to draw people in and allow them to get back to the downtown area. Here's a map explaining kind of some distances. So connecting in the center of this destination development plan, you can see the quarter mile, half mile, all the way up to one mile um, and some estimated time. So within a three to five minute walk, you can get to a lot of the downtown area. Um, most of that means those two main connector streets at a half mile. So that's about 10 minute walk. So 10 minutes, you can get to most of the businesses in downtown and even some adventurous people um, within 15 or 20 minutes could walk from that site up to the, the Capitol building, for example. So definitely a walkable, connectable type location that, that really is um, great for this kind of development or future development. Here are some example photos of those gateways and connectors. Uh, this was from survey number two, and you can see on the bottom left, Arbor Archway. That was the preferred choice by the public. And then second place, second choice came in as the plaza or open area. And then a third choice was informational signage. And the port is actually currently working on some signage along the Willie Frank Jr. Trail um, as part of that. So this might actually tie in well with, with what they're currently um, working on. Here's a blow up. So this is site A on the kind of north point, if you will. You can see um, just to the north of that is actually the KGY site. But here's a breakdown of each site. Um, so it gives kind of area, current use, which this site is a parking area with an office building or undeveloped site. Then we also list some potential uses. So a hotel or mixed use or even a cultural center. Cultural center might be a great opportunity for this particular site. We establish the zoning, uh, allowable heights that have been established by the municipal code, any kind of setbacks, shoreline setbacks, and allowable coverage. So the idea is that this is kind of a marketable piece that the port can take and, and give to potential developers and kind of solicit interest in, in these areas. Site B, here's another example. This is the actual, um, existing is the parking. We're planning that existing to remain. Um, that's currently the Cascade Pole site. It does have the KGY radio antenna there. Um, some of the setback or height requirements are all pretty much the same throughout. But yeah, for the most part, this current we're proposing as existing to remain. There's um, key community feature parking requirements for the boat launch that uh, I think this site serves pretty well. Site C, again, another area I think is existing to remain would, would suit well. That's the four building is right there, right by the boat launch. They have the boat launch and also adjacent parking for the marina. So not a lot of area uh, potential use for here except for existing as is. Site D is a little different. This is where um, some potential, uh, I guess current use is the marina office, parking, dry storage, and a little bit of undeveloped area. But some potential use is the port admin building, um, some mixed use or light industrial. You can see those type of amenities going into that location. Site E, that's currently an undeveloped site. There's a proposed use right now for an RV resort, um, but some other potential uses would be mixed use, light industrial, small watercraft launch, for example. Um, this RV resort, for example, is one thing where it's a pretty quick, easy type project that could go in and then future, it doesn't limit 
uh, future development from coming along. If say a, a different idea uh, comes into play that might take precedent over an RV site or the return on investment for something like an RV site might be small enough with, within a, a handful of years, um, they could get that return and then be able to move on to a different type of use or development in that site. Site F, that's known as a boat works site, uh, marine supply, warehouse, uh, no proposed changes for that particular site uh, existing to remain. Site G, that's just on the inland side of boat works. It's currently undeveloped, but there's some potential maybe for mixed use or dry storage, um, depending on site and setbacks and uh, building size, even uh, light industrial might fit within that space. And then looking at site H, that's that long skinny one I was talking about, not a lot of um, room for development there. Currently under, underdeveloped, so maybe looking at existing to remain, could that turn into a linear park or maybe um, utilize that particular stretch of shoreline to um, improve the shoreline there in a significant way. Site I. This one is inland. It's right behind. You can see that long rectangle on the right. That's the hands-on children's museum. So this is the site immediately to the north of that or behind the museum. Um, potentially, there's some uh, mixed use opportunities, light industrial, and also the idea that hands-on children's museum would like to expand. So that's a great site for, for them to be able to expand into. Site J on the inside corner there, kind of that pie wedge shape that is um, potentially a mixed use light industrial lot also has some um, aspirations to expand. So that's a potential site for them to expand as well, expand their operations. And then site K, this is one inland, it does not have water access, but it's just, um, just to the west of site E. Uh, some potential uses for that site, would be mixed use, light industrial, um, maybe like a pedestrian amenity. So this is right along that connector or linkage to the rest of the development back towards the, the uh, farmer's market. So uh, this might, site might have a, a, a key pedestrian linkage that would draw the public to that site and then further along the peninsula. Uh, oh, maintenance shop is also a potential use for that particular site. And then getting into the sites over water one and then next slide over water two, over Water One is currently the KGY radio station. They do have a lease. Um, it is coming up soon and they have the option to extend that. Um, but if that does not happen, then there's other potential use as existing to remain, museum, cultural center, or combined overwater site. And by that, basically meaning that we could take some of the square footage of overwater site two that's currently there, combine that with overwater site one, and basically essentially move some of that area to overwater site one and return, returning over water site two to a more natural um, shoreline. Over water site two, there's some potential use of commercial, maybe a boating center that's been discussed by the public quite a bit, uh, or cultural center. So looking at some, some potential uses for that. And then this is where we're kind of moving into the next steps. I think we're gonna turn it over to Sam and kind of she'll, she'll give you an update on where we're headed from here. Great, thanks, Amos. And um, I also want to introduce myself. I, I neglected to do that at the beginning. So for those of you who don't know me, I am Sam Gibney, and I'm the executive director of the Port of Olympia. So um, uh, apologies for not doing uh, making that introduction, introduction earlier. So you know, um, wh what happens next? I, I mean, I, I, at first, I think I'd like to um, really start with one of the expressions that I use internally with um, uh, the, the staff quite frequently. And that is when I believe that when we engage the public in, in a manner that we've done here, where we really have asked people to step up and give their time, their attention, their creativity, and to really in, engage with us in a um, thoughtful and caring manner, that when the results of that uh, come back, it is incumbent upon us as a, as a public agency and really as your local port to accept those results with grace and gratitude. 
and that's really the the, the sentiment that um, I'll be uh, carrying forward to as we uh, take this destination waterfront vision to, to the uh, port commission. And that, that is the next step for us is to take it to the port commission for their consideration. If they then uh, uh, accept that, then we start to begin the, the, the uh, continued work of our port planning. And that includes everything from developing a capital plan, which goes into our budgeting process. And, you know, there, there's some, some things of uh, bureaucracy that, that we have to do that really are part of what we're called upon to do in a transparent manner as a, a, as a public agency. And I also want to talk about like, you know, I, in my vocabulary and Sam Gibbity's vocabulary, bureaucracy is not a bad word. It is, it is a systematic way to be able to balance all the, the local uh, interests that we have and to be transparent about our decision making and to really make uh, wise use of the, the, the public dollars and, um, uh, th that we have in the public assets that we're called upon to care for. So I first wanna thank everyone for, for their uh, participation in this. And you know we have a couple pages of quotes. We asked people like, okay, really, how, how was this process? You know, Were we inclusive? Did we reach out to a div uh, diversity of, of stakeholders? I think that we have. And, and I hope that, the, that, that everyone on this call and the public can see is that you know, we, have, we have taken a lot of things in. And I think one of the most important measure is that your input has changed our thinking. It, it really, and it, it has changed some of the things that we're, we're focusing on and where we think we're going. And just as an example of, I think when we started this process, we knew there was kind of some interest in a, in a boating center. But that has really crystallized a, a, a lot more, and and so you know I think step four you know the next steps are to make sure that that we stay engaged with with the various stakeholders and people who are are interested in having operations down on on the peninsula, and that we are um, keeping you involved as we go through our bureaucratic process of how how do we safeguard the public's investment and really live up to to our mission. Um, we will be having uh, uh, taken to the public the, to, to the commission in two public meetings. Our regular meetings on March eighth and then the twenty second. Uh, we'll be accepting uh, public comment as we normally do at those meetings. So I really uh, encourage you to participate um, one more time. And. Through all of this, what I think that, you know, I, I really want to note, and this is what I, I feel is through, through all of this, and yes, there's some bureaucratic wranglings and things that we have to do, but what I feel one of the, the, the greatest results of this process is that we've really ar arrived at this point in time with, you know, some real excitement and, and that there are a number of people that are looking at our waterfront and going, we have the opportunity to develop this in a way that is really reflective of our community values, that balances these interests and really leaves a legacy for, for decades to come. And that is super exciting. It's also humbling. And, you know, but, but here we are. And I think that this process has, has done a good job of capturing the talent and the imagination of, of this community. And I, for one, am uh, grateful that you have joined us and grateful for what happens uh, to see what um, comes next. Because I think with this amount of, of talent and perseverance that we can um, continue to advocate for resources outside of our community to help us achieve this vision. So thank you so much. Thank you for that, Sam. So um, again, final commission presentation, Monday, March 8th, and again, to follow up on the 22nd. I went through that slide pretty quick. There's a lot of material. Um, if there's something that you want me to go back and reference to expand upon, happy to do so. Uh, we have a few minutes left, so I'd like to open it up for any kind of comments or feedback from the public at this time, unless there's something else from the team you wanted to share. Yeah, and, and Amos, if you just want to, I, I, you, you may have done this already, but um, Amos and I are, we will stay on this call. We, you know, we want to be able to allow people to um, 
uh, sign off at the appointed time. But if you want to stay on and have uh, ask questions or make comments, uh, Amos and I are, are committed to uh, uh, staying until we get uh, get through everyone. Thank you. So feel free to uh, raise your hand or uh, issue your question. We also can receive some by chat. So we'll go through the chat comments and questions as well. Amos, can you hear me? Yes. This is Richard Wolf. I've got a, a suggestion and I got a question for you. Suggestion is, um, as you're going through the, the site maps, um, I think it would be very helpful for the commissioners and for the public to see the setbacks mandated by the shoreline master plan. And I helped work on that for the, for the city and I know that the the master plan does include maps of that area that shows the setback. So it would be pretty easy, I think, to uh, put that onto the maps that you've got. And I think that's very important because of some of the things you're talking about, um, it's, it's, it sounds good, but it may not fit. Like the RV park is, is a real good example, I think. I think the setback there may be 75 feet. I'm not sure. Um, I don't, I'd have to go back and look, but um, I think that, you know, that could put a that, that's not a very wide spot to begin with. So I'm, I'm not sure how that works. So I think it would be good to have that and be uh, something that would, would maybe clear up some things and make it more reasonable to, to make assumptions on types of uh, construction or, or, or economic development on that site. Um, it's enough of that. The other, the other thing I had is I noticed in the surveys that in the first survey, the sailing center was almost dead last. I think it was second to last. In, in one place and, and, uh, and fifth or sixth from last in another place. Very low, very low suggestion for sailing center. But then on the next survey, I think it was the next survey, it, said it came out like it was the fifth most popular. Do you have any insight as to why that, that change? Sure, so the survey number one, uh, again, that was based a lot of open end type, open end type questions that allowed the public to type in their responses. So we waded through all of that data, the 442 some odd responses, nine questions each. We waded through all that data and boiled down um, basically the essential of what we heard from each, each comment. And we took away some keywords. So those keywords, if we saw those things reoccur multiple times, then basically said, okay, that, that requires some attention. If it was maybe one comment and no other people were kind of lining up with that, that didn't get a recorded here in this particular uh, summary. But when we saw multiple comments to reoccurring theme, then we, we documented that. So for example, on this slide, question five, the standing center looks like it was fifth on the list of uh, ways to improve or provide public access to water. Four, yeah. yeah, four. So then moving forward to survey two, let me jump to that. I think it was just more of a, of these options, which do you prefer the most? So then when kind of survey one, it was more open-ended, you could you know, provide any any kind of amenity that you'd like and request that. Survey two was more specific on, of the four or five options, what was your preferred one? And that's where we saw the same center start to rise to the top. Can I just jump in quickly, Amos? I'm sorry to interrupt, I may be out of order. But when you look at the basic responses, some of the, there's some overlap. So these are not necessarily mutually exclusive categories. So the small boat resources where you have small boat rentals or docks uh, or sort of upland storage of a dinghy, all of that would be sort of a function of a sailing center. Right. So in terms of the, the open-ended responses and how people are writing, they may not have said uh, boating, uh, sailing center, but they may have said things like small boat rental. So it sort of combines a fair amount of things when, when people uh, talk about a sailing center. Right. And that was kind of part of when we, we took this information, we then moved that into survey two, thinking, okay, these pieces, they can join together. So moving forward with the sailing center, you're gonna get both a small boat resource as well as a sailing center. Uh, I see a question here from Joyce on how to participate in the March 8th and March 22 meetings. Uh, so the port's website, 
will be able to, that has that posted up there, but you can find a link um, to, to be part of those meetings. I believe they are at 5.30 on Monday, the, the 8th, and also on the 22nd. So go to the port website and you can, you can click the link and join the meeting then. Yeah, and then a public comment is taken near the beginning of the meeting. And um, so uh, we do ask if you can, if you can sign up for uh, public comment uh, beforehand, it just helps us to be a little bit more orderly, but we do uh, make sure that um, we, we use the raise uh, hand uh, feature that um, uh, if people wanna make comment and they, they didn't have an opportunity to sign up in advance. Hey, Ms. Paris has his hand raised. Uh, is it Karen? Paris. Oh, Paris, sorry. Go ahead, Paris. Hey, thanks, Amos. Um, so uh, I, I really appreciate the suggestion for that layer of the Shoreline Masters Program um, uh, map um, on the existing map for um, the waterfront development map. I think it'd be really helpful uh, to just see where development is actually possible and um, and uh, consider environmental impacts. But um, the other thing that I wanted to mention in the same vein is I wonder if there is, with the climate mitigation plan, um, I wonder if there are sort of quotas or benchmarks that need to be met for um, carbon, sequestra carbon sequestra sequestration for things like, uh, you know, I, there's talk of green space um, being incorporated in this plan and living shoreline and things like that. But I wonder if there's actual quotas or, or uh, metrics that need to be met. So um, and that might be an interesting thing to include in this as well. Um, so what's not part of this actual study, I think that it's something that would definitely need to be addressed and looked at um, on a more site specific type basis, case by case, project by project. Sam, I don't know if you have any other feedback on that aspect of the. Um, um, sure, I think one, one of the things that the um, uh, commission has asked the um, Port of Olympia Citizens Advisory uh, Committee to um, work on this year is looking at the uh, Thurston County Climate Action Plan and how we can uh, best support uh, uh, th those efforts. So uh, uh, they'll be doing that work uh, uh, in conjunction uh, with, with staff. Um, the other thing is, um, so we uh, definitely have are participating in, in, in a local agreement for uh, sea level rise uh, as well. And uh, we have our uh, next kind of government uh, structure um, in a local agreement that will be coming before the, uh, the commission on that. And then um, last but not least, we also have a um, greenhouse uh, gases inventory that, that has been uh, been completed. And um, I think the POCAC is gonna uh, look at that as well. Um, we here through the grapevine, <laughs> again, as a, a civil engineer, I keep praying for infrastructure <laughs> um, a package to co come out. Um, but we hear that there are uh, uh, gonna be uh, dollars in there for um, uh, greenhouse uh, uh, gas uh, reduction and energy efficiency uh, dollars and things coming out. So everything from you know looking at our um, particular operations and and uh, ways to reduce our carbon uh, footprint there. So um, we have we kind of have you know parallel tracks that, that are going going along with this that will inform the uh, destination waterfront planning and any uh, particular project. And, but we have these overarching plans uh, that we participate participate in as well. So look at the clock. It says six thirty. Uh, again, we want to be respectful of people's time. We appreciate you being part of this and listening. And like Sam mentioned, we are sticking around. So if there's more people that wanted to um, offer some co questions, comments, or feedback, feel free to, to stick around and, and connect with us. Um, but I just also wanted to provide an opportunity now if anybody needed to take off or leave, that, uh, feel free to do so. Thank you. Great. Amos, I've got uh, Janice's iPad has a hand raised. Okay, Janice. Here's Janice. 
I don't know if you can see me or not. Yes. We can see and hear you, perfect. You can, I can't see myself. That's a little disconcerting. <laughs> well, um, I'm, I'm Janice Arnold. Um, first of all, I just want to say, I really appreciate all the work, Amos, that you've put into this. And also Ron Thomas and your whole team. I know that you guys are um, a tight knit group and doing great work. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And also I want to say uh, to Sam and uh, you're just such a champion of the progressive approach of forward thinking and this open team building approach that I really, it's inspiring. And um, I know you, uh, like all of us, are aware how incredibly fortunate we are to have this remarkable waterfront asset. And we have an opportunity to, I think, approach it in a way that is... Um, is speaks to this unprecedented time of climate crisis. Um, and I really appreciate that the Thomas team designs uh, as much as they can to the lead environmental standards. Yet um, with the speed that things are going and the effects of the climate crisis, I want to say that we really all have to push ourselves out of our comfort zone to, um, to go further to do more. And um, I was really heartened in my conversation with Sam that she has, she shares these amazing ideas for a holistic approach that's both environmentally sustainable and economically sustainable because those two things are not mutually exclusive. They um, can work in consort. And it's a, it's a completely new way of looking at developments, I understand, but there is an international foundation based in Seattle that is that exists to support communities and developments like ours that have a model of success that is um, buildings, living buildings, as they're called, are um, being built around the world. And this approach is two, three, fourfold. It's educational, it's environmentally correct beyond our wildest dreams, but also it serves to make a model, you know, Olympia could be a model, our waterfront could be a model for this approach. And while I recognize that it's, it's challenging, mm -hmm. it is also beneficial to you as architects. I know the um, living building that I worked with in Massachusetts, the architectural firm that worked with them is now getting contracts from, from building uh, develop from developments all over the country because they have experience with this living building approach. And so I really challenge your team to look seriously at this living building model. It's a living community model. And when I spoke to the foundation and when I spoke to Sam, I said, you know, we could have a living waterfront um, approach. So we challenge ourselves to work together. I mean, I'm, as Sam knows, I am invested in supporting this to be something that people travel from all over the country to see how we have succeeded in these um, challenges that we are all gonna be facing. So um, I will stop there, but I encourage you to look into the International Living Future Institute in Seattle, Washington. And uh, Amos, I'm happy to connect you with um, people there that I've been speaking with um, about bringing this to Olympia. <laughs> so thank you for listening to me. <laughs> All right, thank you for that, Janice. You are welcome. Okay, it looks like uh, Melissa Denton. Uh, Janice, if you could even put a link on the chat session and maybe other that are interested could see that as well. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, I'm not sure if I know how to do that. Um, the chat section. I'm using my iPad and share content. Here we go. Maybe this is it. Hmm. Um, uh, I'm going to switch over to my computer. Oh, you can figure it out. You provide it. And then uh, otherwise, I'll, we, I'll yeah, figure it out while, while you continue to chat and I'll unmute myself and take the video off. Great. Thank you, Janice. I had a question um, and I was called on. So I wanted to ask about wildlife 
we've talked about environment, which sort of obviously relates to wildlife, but um, we have a lot of responsibility to the, the ocean life and the other life that is around us. And I'm not uh, trying to be preachy about it, but I didn't hear any reference to that. And I wanted to know, I'm, I'm sure that that's part of the thinking, but I thought it would be really nice to, to bring that out some because uh, we live in, in harmony with other things. And this, this is a place where we're right downtown and we're right on nature. And I just wanted to hear what the thoughts are on that. Sure, I can, uh, I can take that. Um, so I, I think that that is uh, definitely in uh, one of our uh, core focus areas and our, our core resp responsibilities is our, the, the stewarding of the natural environment. And I also think that, that we uh, effectively do that when we, when we partner with um, uh, groups that, that do that particularly well. And so um, as we are looking at our uh, uh, we're one of our first buildings here, which is we're calling the uh, uh, Marine Center, and that would be home to uh, both our administrative offices and, and the Marina office, but also um, should we receive funding from the legislature, which we are act, uh, asking for it to be included in the capital budget for this next biennium, would uh, allow us then a uh, tour to be home to the estuary uh, as well. And, and so, and as you, you're probably familiar with them, it lo looks like, like you are, that is really their mission is to, um, to educate people about the, and, and maybe uh, Paris is, is still on here. He can probably, um, I'll tell you more succinctly what their uh, mission is, but to educate people about the unique um, ecosystem that is South Sound here, as well as then to connect um, both school age kids as well as lifelong learners to, to the shoreline and the uh, uh, natural environment. We, we also then have our own going obligations and um, to um, continue to invest in uh, the treatment of uh, like stormwater off the marine terminal, certainly uh, any of the development that we go along um, on this that we would be um, continue to use you know, the, the, the highest and best practices for the treatment of, of stormwater off of um, anything that we build. Um, I'm particularly excited about the concept of the, the living shoreline because that's really where that that near you know your the, the, the near shore is such this rich um, literally biologically rich area that I think we can do better in and we can we can you know uh, look for ways where we have protection from from sea level rise but it's not just a, a hard and inhospitable environment so um, lots of opportunity uh, for us there. I think then, you know, again, you know, port wide or the industry wide, uh, we also uh, look to uh, our uh, local association, the Washington Public Ports Association, and then we look for ways to partner with our sister ports throughout the Sound. Um, like I, I'll tell you, just uh, recently we're signing on to a letter for um, uh, quiet sound um, standards for to, to help protect the, the orca population. So um, lots for us to do there, keeping it at, at, at the forefront. Thank you so much. Looks like that's all that had hand raised, um, their hand raised, but we do have quite a few questions in the chat. So yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna roll back to some of those, Jenny. Um, it looks like Tony Sinclair is gonna be the first one if you roll up to that. that okay, great, yeah, I saw with. that. And, and so, Tony, we are in receipt of that PowerPoint. Um, we're not asked uh, at, at this point in the game asking for really specific proposals for, for any one uh, of the uh, locations. Um, when we get a little bit further in the process, um, we will likely be, you know, uh, reaching out to um, a, a request for proposals for any number of things, be they actually business development or art installations, et cetera. So, um, a little bit uh, early in the uh, in the process for it, but um, I, I, I did find your um, PowerPoint fascinating and would love to chat with you about it sometime. Totally understand. Um, my initial proposal uh, was just to to bring interest uh, yeah. to uh, this this idea, uh, and then also bring in the maritime um, history or. Uh, that Chuck was talking about the maritime uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
fund that the, the, the grant that was received, but bringing that whole idea throughout the entire Puget Sound. Yep. So each individual city would have their own, you know, pool light, you might say, to show the, the quality of the water. Great. Okay. Um, I think the next question, we got the public comments. Again, uh, public comments will be taken at our next two meetings where um, this plan is presented to the commission. We take those uh, pretty early on on the, uh, the agenda. And again, ask if you can sign up in advance. It just helps us to, to manage um, uh, the events a little better. Um, the next really, question looks like it was about hotels in the area. Hotels in, in the area. We have been in, in um, uh, contact with um, the um, uh, Olympia Downtown Alliance and they uh, participated in um, uh, this, this planning process on our advisory group. Um, there is, is concern to make sure that we are, as we develop the, the peninsula, that we're doing so in a way that's really complementary to the downtown and not kind of a, a competitive in a way that draws um, a business away and harms the downtown. So that's one of those, uh, those principles that we'll be carrying forward uh, uh, as well, is to make sure that, that you know, we're, we're really trying to build a, a healthy downtown in environment that extends out onto to the peninsula and that the peninsula is not somehow uh, separate from, from that. Um, okay, next question. Um, does the port have any role to play to mitigate the homeless problem uh, that's worsening here? We have been um, uh, playing a role most recently uh, we have donated use of our warehouse space on the Marine Terminal, um, as well as the um, Longshore Local 47 Union has donated their, their labor to work with both the City of Olympia and a host of volunteers that are coming down and building what they're calling micro houses. They're basically like um, uh, eight by eight sheds and that are, that are uh, well insulated. That, that uh, process is underway uh, right now. And, um, you know, I, I have to say that, you know, it is one thing to have a donation of, of warehouse and it's a, it, it is another level of coordination to do so on our federally secure facility that is the, the, the Marine Terminal, but we're able to, to work it out and be able to have the social distancing protocols and everything in place. So, um, uh, that is well underway, and I want to um, express my gratitude to the Marine Terminal staff who have uh, really gone out of their way to make that happen, and once again to the uh, local uh, Longshore 47 for their generosity. They are they just so so frequently step up when the community asks for things. They step up and uh, very generously give their time and labor. Um, we've also um, participated in uh, we donated some warehouse space. Earlier, um, early in the pandemic, to the More Right Group, and we're able to help them facilitate the dispersal of surplus goods that they receive from various um, uh, retailers throughout, throughout the country. And so, we're able to get out things like um, uh, sanitary wipes and uh, PPE and 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 things um, to families that were in need. So we we're able to do that for uh, a number of months. And then we were also able to donate some space out in Tumwater at one of our building, buildings to for the creation of an agricultural hub, which saw the, and, and this was so creative, it was um, uh, received dollars to employ people who were, who had lost their jobs due to COVID to help then sort and prepare packages of locally produced um, uh, pro, uh, local produce from local area farms to then go out to families who were, were again had been affected by by COVID. So it was just this kind of beautiful circle of of, of the community giving back to itself, and uh, we were able to help uh, make that um, effort happen very quickly by donating some space to that. Okay. Um, I'm looking for, another question from Carla Wolfberg. Um, 
Okay. My understanding the two surveys that were a little any interest in hotels that would be surprising to still being considered. Um, yeah, I'd say that, you know, somebody asked me earlier today is like, you know, is, is that a done deal? And I said, absolutely not. It's, it, it's not a, not a done deal. And, um, you know, I think that it is, um, uh, there is still quite a bit of uh, in interest in the marketplace for us. And that tells, tells us something. Um, and so um, that, that'll definitely be decisions that will be made by the, the, the port commission. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep that in the mix. And there's the link for the Living Futures Institute. There was a short little question from Bob about what about houseboats? What about what? Houseboats. Houseboats. What about houseboats? <laughs> I think that that was posted um, when Janice was speaking. Oh. Um, and so that I think was in relation to what she was discussing. And so he posed that question. Oh, okay. Great. Is that any other um, people still online had any things they wanted to share or add? Oh, it looks like Bob just added a clarification in relation to housing for people. Um, not sure I'm, I'm, I'm understanding that, uh, that question, Bob, if you want to, um, uh, email me uh, uh, more directly about that or, or something we can have a, a, a further conversation about it. Um, is it okay to just say something? Uh, sure. Yeah, okay, because, well, I thought there was some talk about expanding uh, how many houseboats could be uh, in that area, and I didn't hear anything about it today, so is that true or no? <laughs> But I don't know. Yeah, not not in our marina. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hello, I, I would like to ask one more thing as long as you're suggesting we can do that. Sure. This is Joyce Mercury. Uh, could you somebody say a little more about that um, site? two, I think, which is over there near the port dock that has the dilapidated um, dock on it. Um, is that being kind of, is it being kind of saved maybe to trade for having more overwater somewhere else? Or is there any um, potential option to just remove that and um, create at least some little bit of a habitat there? Um, yeah, we don't have firm plans for, for that. I think that this area has garnered a uh, a lot of uh, attention and curiosity for um, its potential utility for a, um, a boating center to pr provide people with uh, access to, to the water. That's that's kind of the, the thing that's risen uh, most to the top. There's also been uh, a talk about um, what about the uh, Crete so pilings there or other other um, uh, uh, within other areas as well whether they can be removed or sleeved and to uh, improve, improve the habitat uh, quality in that way as well. Um, so so no, 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 no talk of complete removal. I think more, um, more talk of potentially uh, rehabilitation and upgrade uh, of this in ways that can uh, both have environmental ben benefit but also provide uh, public access to the water. So there's no concern about it being too close to the port ships and stuff? There right. might be. Yeah, there, tr trust me, there's a whole lot of questions that need to be asked <laughs> uh, be, before we, I mean, th there's there's a whole lot of questions. Anyone else? Okay. That's well, it. Thank you, everyone, um, uh, again, so much for your, your time and attention and engagement. And hopefully we'll see at least some of you at the March 8th meeting. Thank you all.